Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Derek Wills, and you are listening to Lone Star Gun Talk. Welcome to the show. I am super glad that you are here. We have a lot to get to today and, uh, you know, a lot to talk about. There is big news coming out of the U.S. Congress, specifically the House, uh, regarding two bills that have to do with your right to bear arms. And one of which is H.R. 38, which is commonly known as the National Reciprocity Act. Now, this has a lot of people excited, but I want to talk about a different perspective on this um, because I'm not excited about it. And uh, we will get into that. And as well, alongside uh, that bill, H.R. 4477, which is the Fix Nix Act of 2017, uh, has also passed out of committee and will be debated and likely voted on this week. Uh, this bill is supposed to uh, fix the discrepancies with the Nix background check system that allowed for the Sutherland Spring Shooter to legally obtain his firearms so he could carry out his atrocious act. Make no mistake about it, this bill is Republican-backed gun control and should be opposed by everybody. And we're going to get into all of the details of that. And to help us out with this, I want to bring in uh, Byron Schirmbeck, who is the state coordinator for Texas Campaign for Liberty. Byron, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Derek. So uh, we have two bills that the U.S. House has passed out of committee. One is national reciprocity, uh, which sounds good on paper. Uh, there are some current concerns that I have with it, and I kind of want to get your thoughts on it. And the other is this Nick's background check um, fix, if you will, which is, in my opinion, just more republican back gun control. Uh, I want to talk first about, let, let's talk about the one that everybody seems to be excited about, and that is the uh, national reciprocity. Give me your thoughts on it as a whole before we kind of get into the details of it. Um, well, I think, you know, my view is probably the same as most people. It, it, it seems really appealing on the surface. It seems to fix some problems that uh, we've seen recently, like the young lady in uh, New Jersey, who was arrested for carrying uh, her weapon when she was uh, fearful of her life uh, with with her kids. Um, and I'm sure we like the idea that we might be able to travel and, and uh, be able to defend ourselves. So naturally, it appeals to uh, our self-interest and some of our desires and some of the things that we want to do. Uh, but like a lot of things, when you look past the, the initial uh, appeal of something, you have to start looking at the nuts and bolts and start questioning the, not just what it is, but on uh, how we get there and what it really means, what are the unintended consequences and what are the future consequences. And I think anytime that we say, uh, as I think most people are uh, that would listen to this show would be a, a, a liberty-minded individual. Uh, we don't normally like the feds coming in and telling us how we're going to do things in our state. Um, and that's a good natural first reaction to have uh, is one of suspicion whenever somebody says we need the feds to come in and fix a problem uh, because it never ends there. Uh, you can look at pretty much anything. Uh, government take takeover of health care. If he just told somebody that, well, we're just going to uh, pass some laws to where people that have pre-existing -con conditions can't be denied their insurance and everybody can get low-cost insurance coverage. Well, yeah, I mean, who would say that they're against all that? But then you start looking at, oh, okay, well, in order to accomplish that, uh, the feds have to ration health care. <laughs> they have to control what plans that you can and can't buy. Um, and so we kind of realized that, well, maybe it wasn't such a good deal to begin with. Uh, I kind of have those concerns with the national reciprocity. Um, one of the things that Campaign for Liberty has been fighting for a long time is a national ID card, which the feds have been uh, pushing for all of us to have one ID card that's good in all the states. 
Well, setting the precedent that we should have something, some sort of identification for a handgun to carry that uh, in all the states just opens the door for more regulation of that. Um, to put it simply, you know, if, uh, if they have uh, regulations for that, we're all going to have to follow those, and it's not going to be the best things for our interests. Right. And it seems like anytime something like this happens, it's essentially the uh, the camel sticking his nose into the tent. You know, if if we have a federal, you know, a federal identification program, uh, well, we already do. It's called a passport. But if we have one that's mandated, especially if it's mandated for you to carry, then you effectively start a registry of uh, gun owners in this country who like to exercise their rights. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of the danger is, is that anytime they say, uh, oh, we're going to uh, take away a right of yours and then we're going to license it back to you, everyone gets excited. Oh, boy, I'm getting my rights back. Well, no, you're trading those for something else. Um, and... One of the arguments that's sold at the National Reciprocity Program is that, well, this is going to, uh, it's going to be similar to a driver's license, so there won't be as much confusion when you're going from state to state. Well, you still have to follow certain state laws uh, with this, under this program. The right. Certain state laws on like where you can go, where you can carry and can and can't carry. So. What's to prevent uh, a state that doesn't like this program from just saying uh, you can't carry a gun, you know, within uh, 20 feet of any road in our right. state or, you know, something utterly ridiculous. Right. Uh, and, the, and the bill actually says this as much that it it's not intended to uh, supersede or limit the current state laws as to where people can and can't carry. And, you know, nowhere in this bill would it make it legal for you or me to carry in the state of California or New York, which is what I think a lot of people might might believe that it does. Right. And, and, and in some ways, it, it, they actually do uh, honor a little bit of federalism by saying, well, we can't supersede uh, local laws. So it almost makes it kind of a moot point. Um, but, but whenever you put, you, when you put a, a, an entire system in place like this, where you have, uh, essentially every gun owner, uh, in the system, uh, you, people have to remember, it's not always going to be friendly guys that are running the, the federal government. Sometimes the other guys win and they get to control everything. So, uh, my cynical mind says what's going to happen when the anti-gun people take over the government again uh what are they going to be able to do with a a card that has every gun owner in the system <laughs> for right. the federal database you know th there's almost no end to it, it, uh, it's, one it of the, oh i'm sorry go ahead yeah one of the things that they've always wanted to do was to make the cost that they even though their ultimate goal is to ban all private ownership of firearms, if if, you, if they were really honest about it, they won't come out and say that. So what they do is they try and make things uh, prohibitively expensive or hard to get, and that way they're backdoor banning everything. Right. Uh, one of one of the things they say is that they want to force uh, gun owners to have very expensive liability insurance on your gun in case. Uh, it's used to kill someone, right? And so, why can't they just, you know, insert a piece in the in the in the new code that says that if you want to use your national reciprocity card, you have to carry insurance to cover you on this, right? Um, now, so, bef before we get too deep into this, I just want to make want people to understand that this bill does not in uh, create, at least in the version that I have. It does not create a, a national card. It's it's wanting people to use their existing IDs, but we're just trying to show what could come out of this. A lot of people, whenever they, they look at, at uh, ideas like this that sound good on paper, they don't think about the unintended consequences that are associated with that. So, you know, I can easily see a federal uh, carry license coming out of uh, for this. 
Right, and that's the point that I was leading into. Currently, as it's written, you're correct. Uh, your current state concealed handgun license allows you to carry in other states that that have concealed handgun license or you know subject to their laws. But uh, what always is going to happen in cases like this is there's going to be conflicts on uh, what constitutes the minimum amount of training, uh, you know, what kind of caliber can you use, how many rounds can you have, what kind of magazine, what kind of gun. So there's going to be all these questions and all these uh, legal questions that have to be answered. And guess who gets to answer them? It's going to be the feds, probably the Supreme Court. So this is eventually going to land in the hands of the Supreme Court. Now, do we think that we're going to get the benefit of the most generous states? <laughs> Probably not. Um, so that leads into another problem. If you're if you currently do like your state handgun license, the odds are is that states are going to say, well, why do we need to continue our handgun license program? Why don't we just make everything a federal program? Then you have to go go through federal guidelines on testing and all this stuff to get the license. Why is the state going to duplicate that? Right. And they'll be probably uh, listing out qualifications and uh, things that are disqualifiers and basically, like you said, come out with a federal form of training. These are the minimum standards that the states must meet in order to continue their licensing program. And that might further, you know, states like California will say, well, you know what, we're just not going to have one. And we're just going to leave it entirely up to the federal government. And um, as a result, you know, it, you, it's not going to expand gun rights like people believe that it will. And that's one of the biggest um, problems that I have with this bill. You know, you, you mentioned magazines. Magazines are actually listed in this bill. If, uh, if people look this up on congress.gov, it's H.R. 38. And you can find it in here. It says this. The term handgun includes any magazine for use in a handgun and any ammunition loaded into the handgun or its magazine. So that includes revolvers with any uh, ammunition in the cylinder. It includes any magazine that is just in your you know, spare mag pouch, not even loaded into your handgun. So I can see all sorts of issues coming out about it from this. Sure. And, and, all, and since, since it's a federal code, all it takes, even though if you live in, like, let's say, a, a pro-gun uh, conservative state, all it takes is a Democrat sweep in Congress to, re to rewrite one line of code in that law, and all of a sudden, everyone's rights in all 50 states have been taken away from them. Um, they could easily r write one line in there that says, Okay, you can have this, but you can't carry a, a gun that holds more than one bullet at a time because you, you only need to fire once. Right. And this kind of defeats the purpose of federalism now, doesn't it? Correct. Yeah. So, you know, it sounded like a good idea in theory, but the more I look into this and the more I delve into the nuts and bolts of it, the more I don't like it. And, you know, I, I, to be honest, I, I'm opposed to it. And I think that other people should be too. It sounds like it's advancing gun rights, but in my opinion, what it's doing is it's just opening the door to make uh, future gun control easier. Yeah, I, I, com I completely agree. And, and if, you know, right now my handgun license is good for pretty much anywhere that I want to go with reciprocity. Uh, it's, you know, states that have, made agreements between themselves. I'll recognize your handgun license, you recognize mine. And there's not really been that much of a problem with it. I mean, we all know states that are bad about handguns. Well, they're still going to be bad about handguns, even if this passes. Right. So like you said, it's not like this opens us up to uh, open carry in California, you know. <laughs> It, it doesn't know, even open us up to carry in California because exactly. Exactly. they don't have to recognize it. Right. So, yeah, that's it. I wish that it, it, to be, to give them credit, it was marketed beautifully and um, it, it definitely got people's attention and piqued some of the interests of 
uh, the liberty-minded gun owners in in Texas and across the U.S., uh, but th the details of it are kind of obscured from view. So I'm glad that I'm glad that you were able to give your insight on that. Um, I want to move forward now and talk about HR 4477. This is essentially the bill that John Cornyn authored. Uh, this is the House version pushed by John Culberson. And if anybody listening out there, if John Culberson is your congressman, I apologize. Uh, I just am throwing that out there. He's never been uh, he's never been fiscally conservative. He's never been really pro anything that comes to uh, to conservative values. And now his name is on this uh, Nix Fix Act of 2017 that is nothing more than republican backed gun control and you know i was looking through this and and byron i don't know if you've had a chance to actually go through the bill but it seems that this bill does a lot as far as funding is concerned for the nix system uh what do you think um yes um uh, i i have looked through it uh i'm i'm a little a little more concerned about some of the other aspects in it, but uh, some of the most troubling parts is, is, you know, first of all, I guess let's just go ahead and get it out there. Um, in my view, uh, Nix is an unconstitutional gun control scheme, and it has been from the start. Ever since it was a compromise between the NRA and the and uh, Sarah Brady. Mm -hmm. uh, Nix is essentially really nothing more than the federal registry system for our firearms, even though we were promised it wasn't going to be. Yes, and um, I, I've said that, that I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I've said that numerous times on this show. Um, you know, background checks, is seen, it's one of those things that a lot of people seem to be on board with, a lot of gun owners, a lot of pro-Second Amendment people seem to be on board with because it's another one of those things that sounds good on paper. And to be honest, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I think it's a completely unconstitutional thing. Um, I don't think that rights should be treated as privileges, and that's a whole nother issue on it. But uh, anyway, go ahead and complete your thought. Yeah, and really, and I, I had hope. Uh, I wasn't naive enough to believe it, but I figured once we had Republican control over everything, we might start seeing some improvement on on the gun laws, some real generational changes. Um, you know, I was kind of hoping that we would see a, a, re, a total repeal of the National Firearms Act, the Gun Control Act of 1968, uh, the Brady Bill, all these unconstitutional gun laws. Um, so uh, instead, what we're seeing is the Republicans. Uh, putting forward stuff that sounds good on paper and sound bites and makes it look like they're the pro gun guys, but it either really doesn't do anything or it actually could make things worse for gun owners. And th this whole nibbling around the edges thing, uh, it, while time's a wasting, uh, is, is not something that's good. Uh, you know, where, where are we at with the so-called, uh, hearing protection act? You know, that kind of, that they, it still keeps bubbling up, but that's not really moving through like it should. And they're completely um, they, ignoring the Shush Act as well. Right, right. They're, they're, all of the real big things that they could be doing, <clears throat> um, you know, look at, uh, actually, uh, Trump can uh, uh, rescind some of the executive orders, uh, like on the importation of certain firearms um they are loosening that up a little bit where we're able to get some of our stuff back from uh, korea where obama had been holding that up but there's still plenty of uh guns that are banned from importation into the united states that you can go into canada and see um so uh the whole idea that we're going to have the this nix program that shouldn't even be there it's it's a fixed nix program it should be a dump nix program, <laughs> but let's see. Let's just take it for, at face value for what it is. Um, what it really is is it's going to dump more private records into the federal registry database, uh, without a doubt. 
and my concerns about this are, you know, so the argument says, well, it's just making sure that they enforce the laws that are on the books. Well, you don't need to pass another law that says you need to enforce the laws on the books. And this time we really, really mean it. Right. That's, um, that's not how typically any legislation – I've never read a piece of legislation that says uh, the government shall enforce this law that was enacted in 1993. Right. You know, it, does the law become more effective the more times you pass it? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't think so. So w- what it really does is, is it, it, it ups the penalties for not putting uh, things into the system. And it actually pays the states to put more records into the system. Now, even if you can make the argument that, well, you know, these are the things that they're already required to do and states just didn't have the money to put them in there. So they're giving the money for that. Well, if you look at it from the eyes of simply a a state bureaucrat and there's a program where it says your pay and bonuses will be cut if you don't put in all the information in the system. Well, what do you think happens when a record comes across your desk and you're not sure if it applies or not? Mm-hmm. You think it's going into the system? <laughs> of course it is. Yeah. Why, why would you take a chance? You know, whose side are they going to fall on? Of course. Uh, I think they're going to fall on the side of their paycheck. So we're going to see a massive influx of all kinds of records. Who knows what's going to end up in there? And, and whether it's true or not, let's say doctor medical records that wouldn't normally prohibit you from buying a firearm make their way in there and can someday be used against you. Uh, let's say that, you know, you go through, as, as a lot of people do, you may go through a, a period of uh, mild clinical depression and the doctor gives you, you know, lithium, something like that to Prozac to, to go ahead and even you out. Doesn't mean you're dangerous. Doesn't mean you're schizophrenic. Right. Well, uh, maybe you only need that for a year or two. And, uh, you know, how so many women that, go through pro- postpartum depression and need sure. need medication to take care of that? I mean, that's a normal occurrence. Sure. And, and, and these records could very well make their way into the system. And just like we saw with the uh, the uh, uh, the no fly terrorist watch list, you know, there's a lot of people on there that that shouldn't be on there and they were denied being getting on planes just because their name was similar to someone. So, right. And um, that happens all the time now uh, with somebody with a name like John Smith who uh, tries to go and buy a firearm and uh, you know, the the background check doesn't take nearly or or takes much longer than it takes for somebody um, with a, somebody with a name like yours that's relatively unique. And, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people won't even know that they're on the, these lists until they go in to buy a firearm. It's not like the federal government's going to mail them a letter and says, hey, I just want you to know if you ever apply for to purchase a firearm, you're going to be denied. Right. And then that, the question that that always brings up is how do you how do you get off of it? You know, what's the appeals process for that? And why should I have to hire an attorney and spend months? Uh, right to get my name off of a list that I shouldn't have done before. They never provide uh, a sufficient appeals process. In oh no, no, no! But uh, the, but the law does say, and the, what's funny is in this bill, it's talking about um, appealing a court ruling uh, or or something of that nature, and it says not later than sixty days after the date on which the attorney general receives the information the attorney general shall determine whether or not the prospective transferee is the subject of an erroneous record. So you're leaving it up to an unelected government official to uh, make a determination as to whether or not somebody can purchase a firearm, and they have 60 days to do it. That's two months that somebody could be going without being able to exercise their right. And we all know how fast the speed of government is. That 60 days will easily turn into 180 or even a full year. Sure. And, and the, the same thing, whenever you have government code, when you pass a new uh, you know, sweeping legislation, all it takes is somebody to redefine one word or to insert one line in there and it changes everything. So what, what if the bad guys get in power again and they say, well, uh, we're going to change the definition of a prohibited person to include anyone that's had uh, 
a military tour in Iraq because they suffer from PTSD a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's plenty of, uh, people of one party or another that believe people in the other parties are, uh, mentally deficient to begin with, uh, for, for simply for being a Republican or a Democrat. So with the party affiliation, (laughs) we've never had the federal government used to, to to target conservative organizations and conservatives, right? (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not the IRS or anything. No, so, no, no. That's never happened before. You know. So it, 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 again, you know, the, it, it, whenever you have the hammer and you're in power and you're sitting on the throne, the world looks good to you. When the when the other guy has that hammer that's swinging over your head, uh, all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute. It's it's like this newfound respect that the the Democrats have for the limits of the federal government and the Constitution. <laughs> As soon as Trump was elected, right, and you know, you, know, you think about that. D- doesn't isn't that a pretty good indicator that the federal government has too much power? Absolutely. The fact that we're even talking about well, how is this federal law going to, to hurt us uh, is an indication that the, it's probably gone way way too far over it, its original intended uh, scope, without a doubt. Right. You know, there is buried at the ba- at the very bottom of this bill a another provision that, that stuck out to me. And it's Section 6, Bureau of Justice Statistics Report on Use of Bump Stocks in Crime. And essentially what it does is it dictates the Bureau of Justice Statistics to come up with a report of every single time a uh, bump stock is used in the commission of any crime and defines bump stock already in section 921, which is where all of the uh, gun provisions are in title 18. So you've already, the Republicans, if this, if this bill passes, the Republicans have already handed another step of gun control to the Democrats by already defining in the federal code, what a bump stock is and dictated that they have to create a database of all of the crimes committed with it. This, to me, is really the worst part of this bill because it is going to, it, it is taking the first step that Dianne Feinstein wants to take. Yeah, well, well it can't be bad because uh, it's been written by a NRA-endorsed uh, Republican from Texas. Right. Yes, because the NRA has done so much to fight for our rights, um, you know, ever since 1934, whenever they supported uh, the National Firearms Act, Federal Firearms Act, Gun Control Act, uh, FOPA, uh, the Undetectable Firearms Act, the Gun-Free School Zone Act, and the Brady Bill. Yeah, but they're they're fighting for us, right? Right, right. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's seriously, yes, this is the, this is the, again, this is the problem. Oh, you know, there, there's always been this this theory that, or, or you know, th- this notion that, well, we have to protect, uh, we have to get our guys in the government to seize power to protect us from the other guys who are trying to seize power and use it against us. Well, you know, what if there was no power to use against you? Wouldn't that be great? Oh, I know, uh, right? Wouldn't, what if there were no no power that every, that politicians were getting paid off with? Uh, you know, we always talk about corrupt career politicians. Well, what if it didn't pay to be a politician anymore? What if he didn't have that power to dole out to people? So, you know, what, once we start realizing that, uh, stop worrying about all this, this federal stuff and get, get things back to the, as Rand Paul says, a government so small, I can barely see it. Uh, until the people actually stand up and realize that that's what is best for all of us that we can all determine our own future, how we want our own cities and states to look like. And and that means, and we have to accept the notion that that means we have to allow people to make decisions that we don't agree with. California is always going to have different gun laws than Texas, and there's nothing wrong with that. And for Texas to come in and say, California has to match Texas's gun laws, or California to say Texas has to match California's, is just flat out wrong. Right. And that's the whole point of federalism is that we would essentially have um, a number, whatever number that is, today it's 50, 
independent and sovereign states all conducting their own experiment of how government operates best. Yeah, the la- the laboratories of uh, liberty. Yeah, and you know what's what's funny about all of this is that, uh, you know, it, it's it's been a long process that has gotten us here, and there's no overnight fix on it. It has been chipped away at every you know for over the decades over you know over the past two hundred years. It's been slowly chipped away at, and and it's now grown to this massive uh, governmental uh, just entity that that we can't you can't fight on your own. You have so many different um, uh, aspects of it. In fact, I I looked it up. There are four hundred and seventy two different departments and agencies just within the federal government alone. And to me, I think that number should be closer to about 12. You know, 472 is a lot. Yeah, the, the, I think the word you're looking for is Leviathan. And there was, a, there was a, a book by that title. So, you know, people should look that up. It's very predictive uh, of where we're at now. And then when the, the, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, uh, Accounting Office, does a, a, a study, and they can't exactly tell us how many agencies and rules are exactly out there um you know that's another sign that we're in trouble maybe we should just start chopping everything but it's the same way with the let's say the uh, the other bill that's making the fed the news from the feds the tax bill um you know th- we're never going to get uh, a truly good program unless cuts also come with cuts in spending Yes. Which nobody's willing to do. Um, so I'm all for tax cuts. It's great. Let's keep more of our money. But as long as they keep, as long as our unfunded mandates are over 200 trillion uh, that they're keeping off of the books, at some point we're inevitably going to end up like Greece. There's going to be a crash. So until they really cut the spending, uh, you know, it, it's all meaningless. It's all just talk. Yeah, and you know, I it's funny that you bring that up because uh, I listened to Ben Shapiro on a on a daily basis, and he was talking about this very thing today. Uh, he was talking about the tax bill and how the GAO was saying that it's going to increase the amount of deficits that we run every year, and he made the point, you know, cutting in revenue isn't what cuts um, or isn't what increases the size of the deficit. It's increased spending or refusing to cut spending. And, you know, he, he brought up the big three, uh, health and human services, social security, and welfare are always taking up about two-thirds of the federal budget. And, uh, you know, I, I know that this show isn't about uh, tax law and uh, the tax code and, and whatnot, but it, it's true. You know, we shouldn't be, be, we shouldn't be spending $3.5 trillion every year. That's that's atrocious. I can't even fathom that much money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But you know, it, it is all it is all tied together because supposedly we had this. Uh, you know, look, look at what what's happened since at least the rise of the Tea Party, two thousand eight. Uh, we've put in wave and wave after wave of Republicans to stop the bigger government growth, to stop the Obamacare programs, things like that. They campaign on it. They campaign on conservative values. They campaign on, uh, you know, reduced government, fiscal responsibility, better gun laws, um, reducing gun laws. And every time that it happens uh, that we put more of them in there, uh, they fail to do what they're supposed to do. And their solution is, well, we haven't elected enough of us yet. Right. You know, so. That was uh, that was what uh, John Culberson was talking about uh, on the radio in, in Houston, which I, I, I know you live in Houston. I don't know if you listen to KTRH at all, but um, when, when Matt Patrick was still hosting the morning show before he passed, he got into a huge tiff with, with John Culberson talking about, uh, they were talking about raising the debt ceiling again. And, you know, he, he basically said, you know what, we gave you the House, and then you said, well, we can't do anything without the Senate, and then we gave you the Senate, and you're still 
making these bad decisions. And now you're saying, well, we need the White House to really do anything. Well, how about you actually try and do it first? Yeah, and and, and speaking of Culberson, I, I would kind of ask uh, all of our uh, you know uh, listeners out there. Uh, I I think it would be nice for him to hear from you if if you don't support his bill that's going to uh, track and enshrine uh, bump stocks into the next bill. If you don't support the bill that's going to uh, put more private records into a federal registry database. Uh, that you go ahead and uh, give his office a call and let him know because these votes are going to be coming up maybe as soon as Monday. Um, you can leave a message 24 hours and uh, his office phone in DC is 202-225-2571. So, you know, feel free to give a call and say that you don't support uh, the House version of the next bill and that they should work on repealing all the unconstitutional gun laws out there. Yeah, and uh, we should also do the same with uh, John Cornyn in the Senate because he's his name is on that version as well. Absolutely. Contact John Cornyn as well. Um, Ted Cruz, uh, you know, he's been somewhat silent on this, so hopefully he can stand up like he has before uh, away from just doing what it takes to go along to get along. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have faith in, in Senator Cruz. I think he'll do the right thing. Um, I know that Senator Paul will if, uh, you know, as long as the pain is kind of under control for him. Um, and, you, you know, you brought up his line over, you know, from the, uh, the presidential campaigns. And I, I say that his line, that line that you quoted, I want government so small I can barely see it, easily the number two line of the entire campaign. Um, my favorite came from uh, a can candidate for the Libertarian Party, Austin Peterson, who is running for Senate as a Republican in Missouri right now. Uh, he said, I want gay married couples to be able to protect their marijuana farms with fully automatic weapons. Right. I thought that was number one. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, th I think I've taken up enough of your time, Byron. I really appreciate it. Um, if, uh, if people are interested in Campaign for Liberty, how can they find out about it? Sure. You can see what we're doing in Texas and uh, sign up for updates just with an email and a zip code about what's going on in your area. Uh, you can just go to uh, campaignforliberty.com and then you can select uh, on the map Texas and you can see what we're doing on our blog page and then sign up for alerts from there. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time, Byron. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Byron Schirmbeck of Campaign for Liberty. Um, you know, they're a wonderful organization that does, uh, that does a lot of advocating, and uh, I highly recommend that you check them out. Also, please, please, please give John Culberson and John Cornyn's office a call on both this Nix bill and the National Reciprocity Bill. Uh, granted, from the discussion, it's pretty obvious that uh, we at Lone Star Gun Rights oppose this bill even though it sounds like a good bill, it sounds like it would be one to advance gun rights, but you've heard our concerns and the unintended consequences that could result from this. Uh, they're deeply, deeply concerning to us, and so I would hope that uh, this has opened your eyes a bit and possibly changed your mind on it. And if not, that's okay too. I completely understand uh, that perspective of it. I just happen to not agree with it. Uh, to get a hold of John Cornyn, his office in D Washington, D.C. is 202-224-2934, and John Culberson's office is 202-225-2571. Please give them a call and demand that they... Uh, no longer support these bills, even though that they're the ones that off authored them. Voice your displeasure. Be courteous and be kind. Don't curse at them, but please voice your displeasure uh, over these actions because this is more gun control, and you can bet that things are only going to get worse for us in the uh, gun rights organization. So uh, give them a call and voice your displeasure. 
Anyway, please share this podcast with your friends and family. Click subscribe to get new episodes every Sunday. And until next time, Lone Star Gunners, arm yourself with knowledge and share the ammo.